on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. It is an absolute necessity that we come up with some solutions for conservation funding in the United States. If we as a community dig our heels in, if we're obstinate, if we're argumentative or aggressive in any way, we're actually just feeding into the stereotype of hunters, which I think would just feed into neither side hearing each other. The way that we participate as members of that broader community of people who care about nature is a very important question. So I'm always way more interested in figuring out like where somebody's coming from in terms of their value around nature than whatever set of activities they might engage in. The idea that I could no longer hunt or forge, it's like a personal relationship. So it'd be like if you told me I could see my family through glass, but I couldn't talk to them anymore. We should be putting our best foot forward, making it clear to everybody involved, we are passionate and deeply invested in these systems and in these species. Episode number 73 of the Wild Fed Podcast, Ecologically Awake with Dr. Carl Malcolm, is brought to you by Sir Thrival. Recently, I shared an excerpt from an open letter written by over 200 doctors, scientists, and leading health authorities calling for the increased use of vitamin D in the fight against COVID-19. In it, they say research shows low vitamin D levels almost certainly promote COVID-19 infections, hospitalizations, and deaths. Given its safety, we call for immediate widespread increased vitamin D intakes. The truth is, vitamin D is important for a lot more than just your immune function. And while estimates vary from study to study, as much as 40% of the U.S. population is deficient in vitamin D, especially in late winter. Sir Thrival's naturally sourced vitamin D3 is derived from the lanolin in sheep's wool. It's the cleanest, most effective vitamin D3 you're going to find anywhere. It's incredibly inexpensive, and right now, Sir Thrival's Rivals Vitamin D3 K2 is buy one, get the second bottle for half off. Find it and more at SirThrival.com. This episode is also brought to you by WildFoodWarehouse.com. I've been telling you about the incredible hand-foraged wild rice at Wild Food Warehouse. Well, now they're carrying a line of beautiful hand-harvested berry and plant powders from the northern latitudes of Finland. Their blueberry, lingonberry, and spruce tip powders are all sourced from pristine lands north of the Arctic Circle and packed in light-resistant, nutrient-protecting, violet-colored miron glass. I love mixing a tablespoon of these powders into a liter of water, squeezing in some lemon, and adding a little stevia to sweeten it. It makes a super refreshing and really hydrating drink. The rich color and flavor of these powders lets you know that you're getting mega-dosed with antioxidants and key nutrients like vitamin C. Head over to wildfoodwarehouse.com to check out their selection of Arctic-sourced fruit and superfood powders, and of course, for all your wild rice needs too. There, the coupon code WILDFED gets you 10% off your order. And while you're there, pick up some hand-harvested wild rice too. Again, it's wildfoodwarehouse.com. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild fed. Food is all around you. Today's episode with Dr. Carl Malcolm is titled Ecologically Awake. It's something he says in the interview, and I think that title fits him really well. In the way that Aldo Leopold was and is considered the forward-thinking model of a conservationist of his era, in many ways, Carl seems like the model of the hunter-conservationist of the future. Not only is he well-spoken and metered in his delivery, he's inclusive, building bridges between hunters and non-hunters, pushing the conservation conversation into new arenas, and demonstrating the kind of thoughtful ethos that reminds us as modern-day hunter-gatherers how we can strive to be our best selves as we steward the resources that have been left to us. He has this unique ability to communicate about hunting in a way that disarms rather than polarizes. You're going to hear some really interesting stuff in this interview, like Carl's experience working with moon bears in China and the contrast between hunting and conservation here versus there. But we also address something that I've been talking about a lot recently on this show, which is if and how we can bring other stakeholders into the conservation funding model, which today and for many decades has largely been paid for by hunters and anglers. I've been somewhat reticent about a more inclusive model since there's a lot of potential to dilute or even drown out the voices, values, and perspectives of those of us who hunt and fish, and that troubles me. But Carl offers some fresh perspectives and has helped me to get a bit of a more complete perspective on the issue. 
As someone who hunts, fishes, and forages, but isn't really involved at the agency level, I'm glad to know there are people like Carl out there discussing the future of policy. He's easy to listen to, hard to disagree with, and we need more people like him working on the North American model of conservation. Dr. Carl Malcolm, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, man. Glad to be with you. Hey, tell us where you are right now in the world. So I am in a little town uh, just just north of Milwaukee called Cedarburg, which is not too far from the Lake Michigan shoreline. And this is where my family and I have called home uh, since last August. We relocated here for a new job and um, getting to know the area. It's you know kind of a weird time, of course, with being on this lockdown, remote, virtual work mode. Um, but loving the loving the landscape. You know, I'm a Midwestern guy by birth, and so it's kind of a homecoming in some ways. But yeah, great little town. We're digging it here. What kind of weather you got right now? Uh, frosty. I was just talking yeah. to one of my coworkers who's a big fat tire bike guy. Uh, he's got some farmland uh, near Stevens Point, and he's got a like a little network of trails that he grooms. And he was telling me he was out for his fat tire bike ride and failed to adequately cover up all of his exposed skin. And he's got a big patch (laughs) of frostbite on one of his earlobes right now. Oh, like legit, legit, legit frostbite. frostbite. Yeah. Yeah. And he's, he's like, he's, he's a, he's a, a Midwestern guy, like, you know, hardcore, uh, outdoorsman, like very, very rugged, kind of a character and he's like yeah it's been a while since i've had frostbite man you know just like with the assumption that everybody right we you know everybody has these bouts over the course of their lives like yeah man i can't believe i haven't had frostbite in a few years but it's got this notable red patch on his earlobe oh, he was no. just showing off to me this morning so yeah it's cold man it's cold and what's killing me is this new house that we're living in straight out of the 70s um, there's a bunch of work that we need to do and, and we're trying to get a wood burning insert and i'm big on the wood stove And so we're going through all this really cold weather and we're totally hamstrung in terms of heating with wood, which is one of the things I always get a lot of pleasure out of when we have these cold snaps, but yeah, kind of bumming on that front. Yeah. I've got an insert and I, man, sometimes I lament that I can't like cook on it. You know what I mean? I love the heat and I love the ambiance of it, but sometimes like my friends with wood stoves, you know, it's like, oh God, they're, especially because I do a lot of foraging and sometimes processing things, you need a lot of like water leaching, hot water leaching. And putting something on the stove for eight hours doesn't seem that realistic, but putting it on the wood stove does. But man, I love it. Like this weather right now, I'm in Maine and it's just dried out finally. Like it was kind of like a damp cold for a while. And now we're into that cold where it is like dry air. It feels good, man. But uh, hey, so I first uh, came across upon your work. I'm sure a lot of folks tell you this, but uh, seeing you on Meat Eater and hearing you on the Meat Eater podcast and have heard you talk about some things that I just uh, really wanted to dig in maybe a little deeper with you. Um, particularly around the North American model of conservation and kind of where things are headed. I'm somebody who came into hunting as a, you know, pretty late in life and uh, stepped into, you know, I think like a lot of people, I'm sure you meet folks who are like, don't understand that, you know, hunting's even a regulated thing sometimes, or like, you know, how the, how it works, how conservation works. And so when I came into it sort of ignorantly, I guess I stepped in and realized, oh, there's this whole system that's been functioning here, this North American model of conservation slowly came to kind of understand it. But I'm also seeing that we're in a time of really tremendous change. And so I wanted to talk to you about where you see everything headed, but was hoping first you'd give us a little bit of background on you, where you've been, what you've done for work and education. And uh, I know you worked uh, in Asia a little bit, and I'd love to hear a little bit about that first. Sure, man. There's a lot of ground to cover that you just laid out, but I guess in terms of background, um, I mentioned being a Midwestern kid. I grew up in the Northwest Lower Peninsula of Michigan, um, Leelanau County, to be specific, is where I spent a lot of my most formative time. Um, you know, basically playing outside with with uh, a sense of a lot of freedom. I, I sort of jokingly sometimes refer to it as a feral childhood, where we could just wander around and look for morel mushrooms and collect leeks and catch trout. And uh, you know, I guess I was. I was probably 12 or 13 when I got, got my hands on my first light caliber rifle, you know, a little 22, uh, 410 over under that oh, nice. I carried That's around nice with one. me in the woods a lot. Yeah. And, you know, just really initially did a lot of, a lot of small game hunting, squirrel hunting, rabbit hunting. Um, and that really fit in with this kind of broader set of activities kind of at the intersection of being outside, um, being independent being really interested in 
in, you know, kind of the self-reliance and being able to, to hunt and gather, um, and sharing those experiences with people, you know, near and dear to me, friends, family, like that has just been a huge part of my identity from the time I was, you know, from the time I was a kid. So it was really sort of a natural progression from that feral childhood mode into, um, a natural resources education track and had a chance from the time I was an undergraduate at the University of Michigan, uh, studying natural resource ecology and management and environmental policy, and then into graduate school at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, um, where there's this really great deep legacy of conservation history with Aldo Leopold being the the founder of that department and its first chair. Oh, wow. Um, And Leopold's history just being really deep there at the University of Wisconsin, um, you know, totally uh, geeked out on all the Leopold uh, connections of that place. And one of the greatest things about working there at UW Madison is that it also just opened up this door to all kinds of other opportunities, including working with the Smithsonian Institution, um, where I had a, a sort of a dual appointment between the University of Wisconsin and the Smithsonian, both supporting my research over in southwestern China. Um, <laughs> wow, that was, was a nice position yeah. to be in. It was hey, can I ask cool. you yeah. real quick before we get to that part of your story? For folks listening who may not be familiar with Aldo Leopold, could you give us a little primer, real quick, just so they have some context? Yeah. So Aldo Leopold, you know, he he was a man that has like many different titles before his name. He's an, he's an author, a professor, a philosopher, um, a father, uh, a carpenter. Uh, he was a guy that was just kind of like a Renaissance man. Like he had a lot of different, a lot of different skills and facets to his character. The, the thing he's most known for is uh, for being the author of a book called Sand County Almanac. And if folks aren't familiar with that book, if you're interested in kind of human relationships to the natural world and trying to make sense of um, how it is that we can go through our lives in an ecologically awake fashion. Um, a sand County Almanac, I would say is like must read material. So jot that one down and, and jump on Amazon and grab a copy. Um, but Leopold, you know, I, I first was exposed to him like many people through this book, a sand County Almanac when I was wandering those same Hills in Lee County as a kid. And, you know, I, I have reread that book so many different times over the course of the probably 25 years since I first read it. And it's remarkable because almost every time I pick up even just a chapter of that book, I take away different kind of lessons from, from what he had to say. Um, And bear in mind, this guy was, was writing these ideas, you know, now we're talking like 70, 80 years ago that he was putting pen to paper and they're still so relevant today, you know, like just simple questions like how we can live our lives in a way that doesn't compromise the systems that sustain us. And here we are, Mm -hmm. you know, (laughs) as a global community trying to figure out how to, how to navigate through the, you know, the, the challenges of climate change and of species loss, you know, we're in the the midst of a biodiversity crisis. Um, So if anything, his thinking and lessons have, have only sort of risen in terms of their relevance over time. Um, and again, one of the one of the many hats he wore was as a professor, um, and he was the guy that started the the department where I went to graduate school. He also, before that, worked for the Forest Service in the Southwest. So, you know, along my professional journey, I've had a chance to work in some of the same landscapes that helped shaped his thinking. And you know, I think of him as being um, sort of a a mentor. Uh, with whom I'll never have an opportunity to interact directly, but who I feel like I kind of know where he was coming from, from the great writing and thinking that he did. Do you think that, because when I've listened to you in the past, your ability to articulate your relationship to ecology is a bit more advanced than a lot of folks you talk to. And also, I guess, sort of your emotional intelligence around that relationship to the natural world. And some of that, as you're describing, might be born out of the philosophy that you gained from his books and probably a lot of others as well. Um, I'm curious, in the modern conservation world, I meet folks who seem so turned on to that, and I meet a lot of folks who aren't. Where When you got into school, 
did you find that, oh, hey, there's a lot of people here who think about the natural world the way I do? Or were you like, oh, man, some of these folks are not as, I guess, progressive in their thinking about the natural world as I am? That's a super interesting question. And what comes immediately to mind is, you know, the short answer is no. When I got to when I got to school, particularly after being in high school, I started my undergraduate degree at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And I went from a small rural community where, you know, these activities where it's like dirt under your fingernails kind of experiences, hunting, fishing, camping, like being out you know, digging up leaks in the spring and everybody had their secret morel mushroom spots. Like that was, that was kind of my baseline. And I had this collection of people around me who all uh, really could identify with those values and experiences. And I thought when I went to college in a natural resources program at the University of Michigan, I expected to get down there and be like from the first day on campus, meeting all these fellow schoolmates who were excited to you know, work with me to figure out like, Hey, where are we going to go deer hunting, you know, on public ground within striking distance of downtown Ann Arbor? You know, I was expecting those to be the kind of conversations. And instead, you know, I was like sort of an outlier and there were a lot of people who were going, you know, into that degree program, um, who had a lot of values around nature and around wildlife, um, that were different from mine. And at first, to be honest, I kind of bristled from that a little bit. You know, I had this, I had this mindset that the way I was looking at these resources was, you know, the right way. And I was kind of dismissive of other people's perspectives. It's like, you know, don't, don't tell me what, what you think about white tailed deer. Cause you don't even know anything about white tailed deer. Like you, like you haven't had the same depth of personal experience that I have. And the same goes for rough grouse or woodcock or all these, all these animals that Mm -hmm. I felt like I had a really deep personal connection to. And then I was here on campus with a bunch of like city people, you know, I I had this (laughs) sort of classification (laughs) in my head. Right. And I, I have to say, I'm in hindsight, very grateful that I ended up in a place where some of my own perspectives were kind of challenged. And I was, I was, put in positions where, you know, I could either be argumentative and defensive of the position I was in or inquisitive and curious and wanting to understand those other perspectives. And in the time since, um, I have become increasingly convinced of the fact that, uh, especially now in this day and age where, you know, hunters and anglers are going to be a minority, but especially hunters. I mean, you know, the, the numbers speak for themselves. We're never going to be uh, a majority in the population ever again, you know, despite the fact that historically 100% of the human beings on the planet were <laughs> right, exactly. hunters and gatherers, right? Mm-hmm. From this point forward, we will always be a minority. And that's actually a good thing because, you know, these systems that we talk about trying to pull resources from could not sustain uh, the amount of exploitation, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, it's it's just it's not it's not realistic. But the way that we the way that we participate as members of that broader community of people who care about nature is a very important question. And you know, I, I've debated about this with a lot of people, and I know there's a lot of strong perspectives around it. Um, but I personally am convinced that the mode of trying to um, sort of be entrenched and defensive of a perspective uh, as a hunter in this era is not as productive or valuable as being uh, a participant in those activities who identifies first and foremost as a lover of the natural world and a conservationist and somebody who wants to build relationships and coalitions and common ground around those values. Yeah. I know in your Instagram profile, you uh, describe yourself in part as a seeker of common ground, which I really appreciate. I think just to add to what you said a moment ago, if we as a community dig our heels in, if we're obstinate, if we're argumentative or aggressive in any way, we're actually just feeding into the stereotype of hunters, right? So a lot of the non-hunting world will imagine that kind of behavior from us, which I think would just feed into neither side hearing each other. And so like a new approach to how we communicate could be really valuable in tearing down some of those pre-existing, you know, 
Elmer Fudd style kind of uh, stereotypes about us, right? Yeah, there's, you know, there's no shortage of negative stereotypes about what, what hunters are all about. And I think, you know, there's a lot of people like to point to a lot of people within the hunting community like to sort of fear monger about, you know, the antis, what are they going to take from us? You know, everybody's, everybody's out to get, to get us to put an end to these activities, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I see the folks who I, who sort of self-identify as, as passionate hunters who, uh, sort of drive na- nails in our own collective coffin with their own behavior and feeding into those stereotypes as being a much more significant threat to the future of these activities in this community than anything else. And, you know, one of the data points I would point to in this, in this sort of picture is, you know, we basically have like, imagine somewhere around the 10% or less of the population that's super passionate and engaged as active members of the hunting community. And then you have a roughly equivalent group at the other end of the spectrum who are just vehemently opposed to the activity. And then you have this like 80% in the middle of people who don't necessarily give these ideas all that much thought, and they're not really leaning one way or another. Um, but they're the ones that, you know, ultimately, I think, kind of rule the day when it comes to whether or not an activity is seen as uh, generally good and productive and and beneficial to society, or whether it's something that could be sort of left in the heap uh, as history continues to sort of move on and, and societies continue to evolve and cultures continue to evolve. And I think that's where, you know, having people who are, yes, very passionate and active and, um, you know, they know, they know what they're doing out in the woods, like that's part of their identity, but they're eager to rally around um, a conservation vision with anybody else who wants to be part of that. Like that to me is the, you know, at this point in history, that's the most productive thing that any of us can be doing is trying to rally around that sort of overlap in the Venn diagram, that place that we all share, which, you know, it's concepts around like fish and wildlife habitat, human connections to the natural world, all of the health benefits that come from time spent in nature, all of the ecosystem benefits associated with taking care of the systems that provide clean water and clean air. Like you don't have to be a hunter to love those things. And in fact, there are a lot of people who are not hunters with whom I can identify much more closely than some of the people who happen to be hunters, but don't necessarily have the same value set. So I'm always way more interested in figuring out like where somebody's coming from in terms of their values around nature than whatever set of activities they might engage in. And there are a lot of people I I know and appreciate and admire who are not hunters, but who are very passionate about nature. And, you know, and they've indicated that they appreciate what I bring, even if they're never going to hunt and they respect the fact that I have some of the same values and I'm coming at it from maybe a little bit different angle. Yeah. Particularly if you feed them well. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> For yeah. sure. I have, I really, uh, diplomacy, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> really, really well said. Uh, so take us to, back to this story of uh, the Smithsonian and uh, China and all of this, because I'd love to hear about your time there. Sure. It was, it was another sort of revelatory experience to have a chance to work over in China and, you know, I guess the things that I would point to that are probably most, most relevant here is, you know, for folks who haven't had a chance to travel on a direct flight to the other side of the planet, um, there was something about that experience. And I went back and forth more times than I can count now, but it's about a 13 hour flight. If you go direct from Chicago here to Beijing international airport and a 13 hour flight sounds like a really long time to be sitting on a plane. But when you go through the experience of like stepping on an airplane in Chicago and then half a day later stepping off and you're on the other side of the planet, it just drives home the point of how small this little yeah. island of suitable, suitable habitat that we have right. to share is. And, you know, I had all these sort of preconceptions of what China would be like um, and really failed to consider uh how incredibly beautiful and wild and rugged some of that country was. Yeah. You know, I was imagining just places that are 
like totally ecologically compromised and, and so many people and so much crowding. And, you know, the, some of the city experiences I had were like that, but there were also, you know, these nature reserves that were just as breathtaking as any other place I've ever seen, you know, anywhere in the United States, Alaska included, like just rugged mountain ranges, nature reserves where you had like seven different native ungulate species, just wow. a lot of beauty and wildness. Um, you could but imagine somebody app- from, you know, China imagining coming to the States and picturing LA or picturing Manhattan or picturing Chicago and thinking the same kind of thing you're thinking and not realizing. Because, I mean, I don't know, scale-wise, China, I imagine to be a little bit bigger than the United States, the contiguous states, but sort of roughly the same kind of size. Yeah, and it's got some other similarities too. You know, there's this this sort of distribution of people on the coasts and then a lot of really wild country yeah, okay. kind of in the northwest. It's there there's some parallels there geographically. Um but you know, the time in those cities, uh it also had this element of just real awareness around the consequences of us not taking care of mm-hmm. again, just the systems that sustain us. You know, having having days where For example, in Beijing, the air quality is so low that people are advised to stay indoors because, um, you know, just being out walking in the street isn't good for your health. And, you know, it's just been within the last couple of years that as as a uh, source of human mortality, low air quality has recently surpassed cigarette smoking in terms of human life expectancy. Wow. And so, like, these ideas around taking care of nature and how that links to human health and prosperity, you know, to, to be in a place like that. And and we've got our own issues, you know, I don't mean just to point at China, but we have our own smog days and in our big cities. And, you know, if you get to a point where literally people's lives are, are shorter um, because of the condition of our environment and we're not sort of seeing that as a wake up call, there's something fundamentally wrong there so that that opportunity to kind of see like what things could be like in even more places without a course correction is one of the key takeaways from working in china we have you know we live so high on maslow's hierarchy of needs here in the united states right we've been through a lot of those things and we kind of are out on the other side with this new ethic about the environment you'd imagine that taking care of the environment because it is the place from which all our resources come, that that would be down at the base of that pyramid, like basic core survival. But the way our culture is laid out, it's not. Do you see the people of China achieving a similar mindset about ecology in the near future? Or is it politically such a different place that the whim and will of the people won't matter as much? We'll get right back to the show in a moment. But first... This episode of the Wild Fed Podcast is brought to you by the Salmon Sisters of Alaska. I had a great time interviewing Emma and Claire, aka the Salmon Sisters, for episode number 51 of this podcast called Made of Salmon. These ladies grew up homesteading in Alaska where they still live and work commercial fishing for salmon, halibut, and Pacific cod. If you love wild food and you want to sample or fill your freezer with wild-caught Alaskan salmon, cod, or halibut, head over to aksalmonsisters.com where the coupon code WILDFED gets you 10% off your first order of wild fish. Check out their Wild Alaska Coho Salmon Box for vacuum-sealed serving-sized portions or their Wild Alaskan Sockeye Salmon Box for full fillets that'll feed your family and fill your freezer. They've got a smoked sockeye box with ready-to-eat smoked salmon in pouches and their smoked salmon tins, which are also ready to eat. Also, check out their beautiful cookbook, their super cool women's clothing line, and their own custom line of printed Extra Tough brand boots. Head over to aksalmonsisters.com to check out their store and use the coupon code WILDFED to get 10% off your first order of wild Alaskan fish. Now, back to the show. I guess the first thing that comes to my mind when I think about comparing and contrasting sort of a Chinese perspective to an American perspective, and I say this acknowledging from the outset, you know, I'm, I'm an American who spent time in China and I'm not a Chinese national right, who's right, steeped right. in that culture. So I go here with a little bit of trepidation, but, you know, the data speak for themselves. And, and what I'm going to talk about specifically is like per capita behaviors and consumption. And, you know, a couple of key contrasts that I would point to between the United States and China is, you know, the the histories are totally different. And 
we as a nation are so young and yeah. this landscape has seen so much change just during the couple of centuries of you know european colonization post european colonization and so you know being considerate of the fact that there's this deep human history on the north american continent and all the indigenous peoples that had their relationships with the landscape not not dismissing those at all but just this modern snapshot of you know say the last 3 or 400 years the degree of sort of resource extraction and land use change that has occurred in a very short period of time and the patterns of consumption that are still part of our american norm right now versus the thousands of years of history mm -hmm. um, going going towards modern China, and you know, for a variety of reasons, the the much lower rates of per capita consumption and wealth, um, and so you know, I'm I'm very happy. I feel very thankful to be an American, and this is a land of plenty and a land of opportunity and a land of freedom, and those are all things that I treasure. Um, but we're also you know, we're a society of very high per capita consumption. Um, we do live high on the hog compared to the rest of the world. There's some things about that that are fantastic and that I'm very thankful for. You know, there's nowhere else I'd rather be raising a young family and nowhere else I'd rather be a participant in the outdoors, et cetera. Um, but it's not like we've got it all figured out in terms of yeah. how to be right, good citizens right. globally, you know? Right. It's, so it's complicated, complicated though, because they're, <laughs> exactly. they're on a trajectory towards what we're at, where we are now. And then I think when you look at where we are now, there's this uh, kind of a political attempt to deindustrialize a little bit here and kind of start to take us out of that slightly. So it's, are we, I guess it's like we're passing each other in the night <laughs> kind of a thing, you know? Maybe. I mean, the other thing is just from a human population standpoint, like we're, we're so much better positioned to be able to still kind of set some things aside and yeah. have everybody doing really well. Um, you know, the nature reserves I visited in China, um, you know, another kind of detail to that conversation that's relevant here is, you know, I would go into some of these reserves with permission from the government to be there doing my research and with a ton of great support from the nature reserve staff. Um, and some of those places were open to ecotourism. Like you could go there as a Chinese national and stay in one of the reserve hotels and go out on hikes and, and see the wildlife. But there's also a lot of that landscape that was not open to the public and not open to the kind of immersive experiences that we can easily take for granted here in America. Um, you know, it wasn't the case that you could just uh, plan your your backpack hunt and go, you know, deep into the Pull up Chinese the wilderness and, 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 <laughs> right, off, and, pack, yeah. and pack out, you know, pack out a delicious ungulate to take home to your family. Right. And so another one of the takeaways was just like this juxtaposition of what we have in the United States in terms of the ability to experience and participate in these public lands in contrast to um, a very different kind of orientation of management with the Chinese system where, you know, they're still trying to achieve wildlife conservation. A lot of the reserves where I was working are, are panda reserves. They're places where we still have, you know, some of the last lingering populations of giant panda. And so they're, they're getting really important conservation work done, but in terms of how people fit into that equation, it's just a totally different sort of worldview. And that was one of the things when I came back to the United States, you know, and was finishing up school and thinking about what I wanted to do professionally with my career, this whole idea of involvement with our American public land system and kind of that legacy of uh, multiple benefits flowing from the land to make people's lives better really struck a chord with me as a kid, you know, again, who grew up like cutting firewood, uh, hunting small game out the back door. Uh, running a maple syrup tap operation yeah. on our own property, like all those things. It was just like, I want to be part of a system where people, you know, people are intimately involved with the land. And it's not this thing where it's like, oh yeah, nature's over there. And we maybe go and look at it every once in a while. You know, I get fired up about the idea of people 
recognizing and embracing the fact that we're part of these systems. Right. And so that has well, everything I mean, to do with my trajectory. It's it's almost like for me, it would almost, because I talk a lot about the relationships that I have with the species that I, you know, have extractive, that I extractively use. It's, it's like a personal relationship. So it'd be like if you told me I could see my family through glass, but I couldn't talk to them anymore. You know, the idea that I could no longer hunt or forage at the same time. Is it true there's less than 2,000 pandas left in the wild? I'd have to look it up, man. I'm, I, 2,000 yeah, seems like a very high number. Um, I, I just thought, well, what I'm seeing is 1864, 1,864. I mean, at, so I guess my point being... You, <laughs> well, you one look, thing I can tell you for sure about that yeah. number is that it's not correct. Oh, um, yeah? yeah and, and so this is something I, I do know a little bit about because the people I worked with over in China were all part of trying to come up with the best estimates of panda abundance. And okay. you know, the whole idea here with these population estimates is to come up with like your best guess, and then with an error bar on either side of that number, and the right. error bar could be really wide or really narrow. One thing I know, and I'm, I'm again, I'm not an expert on panda population estimation, but I do know it has been a source of great controversy. All the different, all the different approaches that they have attempted to implement around getting a number like that. So I would tell you, there aren't a lot of pandas left in the wild. It's on the order of hundreds or a couple thousand. Um, and I know there's a lot of controversy and a pretty yeah. wide error bar around that estimate. Man, it's hard to it's hard to accept that. You know, when you see something like that, you understand the idea of sort of barring people's extractive use of certain environments at the same time. It's just, it's so complex. Uh, what were you doing though for work over in China when you were there? So we were running a study that was really focused on um, Asiatic black bears. Oh no way! And yeah, yeah. And so we were looking at. Um, essentially how these different nature reserves and the different ways that they were managed were uh, more or less effective in terms of providing uh, refuge for that species. And, you know, I had done some work with American black bears in the upper Midwest, and I had done some endocrinology research as an undergraduate. So that's looking at, yeah. um, looking at oh. hormones and looking at how, um, you know, the endocrine system responds to different kinds of uh, uh, stressors. And like so one of the things, we were, things like that. Yep, exactly. So we were, we were collecting uh, Asiatic black bear fecal samples from all these different nature reserves and then trying to get a sense of uh, the, the ratio of males to females, trying to understand something about the distribution of individuals across the landscape, and then looking at how uh, proximity to settlements, how proximity to agricultural fields, um, how the availability of different foods on the landscape that can fluctuate year to year, like acorns and, and other hard mast, how they've all got, of that. They've got oaks there, oak forests. Oh, yeah. That. Yeah. Cool. it's That's one of the things that's so cool is like you sort of feel like it's a familiar place because I grew up around the same latitude as some of the nature reserves where I was working over there. Okay, so I'd yeah. be seeing these trees. And you're like, oh, it looks, you know, kind of like, looks like kind of an oak tree maybe. And then you'd come over the rise and it'd be an oak tree, but it has like half a dozen golden, golden monkeys in the top okay. of the oak tree, that <laughs> yeah, kind of thing. Okay. So you're like right. sort of familiar and also totally, right. totally sort of foreign. Alien. Yeah. You're looking at like how all of those variables played into uh, patterns in cortisol level in these scat samples. So trying to trying to glean information about how um, those different characteristics of the landscape influenced stress hormone secretion in Asiatic black bears. And then I had a companion set of studies where we were looking at uh, the bile farming trade and <laughs> uh, some of the dynamics associated with raising bears in captivity for for bile extraction, which is a, an ingredient in traditional Chinese medicine. So I was able to use these bears in captivity to do a lot of like validation work on what we were trying to apply to the wild bears. Wow. There's a lot there. I want to ask a couple a questions. There. What first, can you describe this bear to uh, North American listeners who aren't familiar with it because it's such a cool species and I'd love any kind of fun facts you have. Uh, about that <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I guess, Thinking about them, you know, the, the easiest thing is just to compare them to an American black bear. You're talking about something that's similar size, similar build. Um, they have a little bit stouter kind of front end to them. Um, they have a big crescent, white crescent moon on their chest. They're known as a moon bear as well. It's a common 
common name for them. Um, they are, you know, not unlike American black bears, very opportunistic in their foraging habits. They can, they can eat a variety of plant and animal uh, food sources. They raid crops, cornfields. They get into people's uh, livestock paddocks and kill goats and sheep. And there's all kinds of conflict between people and Asiatic black bears. But one of the one of the biggest sort of differences between the two species is that there is much more um, conflict of a dangerous sort between humans and Asiatic black bears than humans and American black bears. And there's a few theories as to why that's the case. Um, but it's not uncommon for Asiatic black bears to attack people. There have been a number of documented cases. Or, or territory attacks? Um, the, the, the cases I'm familiar with firsthand are, are situations where you had bears raiding people's crops and people trying to run the bears off and end up getting mauled. Those kind wow. of things. So very um, different from a black bear in the United States and their behavior. Yeah. Like yeah. Generally. Yep. And, and part of the thinking there is that the Asiatic black bears, um, you know, so there's, there's sort of two schools of thought that I've heard people talk about. One is, um, you know, it's a lot harder in China for your average remote rural agrarian to get his or her hands on a firearm. So, Mm -hmm. Most people aren't out like shooting at bears if there is some kind of conflict, which people would argue has the potential to embolden the bears. But there's also this deeper, more more like rooted in natural history dynamic, which is that Asiatic black bears have sort of coexisted with a a more um, a more aggressive cast of characters on the landscape, including species like tigers, yeah. where they just are wired a little bit more aggressively and prone to. Uh, when it comes to fight or flight, they might be more likely to fight than flight. Um, and so, you know, there's obviously a lot of speculation around those hypotheses, but it is the case that the the number of attacks that I was hearing about while working in those rural communities was strikingly higher than what I was used to hearing about with American black bears in the upper Midwest. Wow. And, and I, sometimes, you know, I hunt a lot of black bears up here in Maine, and I think our population of black bears in Maine is approaching the world's Asiatic black bear population pretty close here. But um, you sometimes see that white crest on the American black bear's chest. But what looks so different to me is that sort of mane that you see on a lot of these bears. Is that on the males and the females? Yeah, they they, they do have that mane. And it, it does give them kind of like a, I don't know, a stockier sort mm -hmm. of a front end look and and uh the white crescent that we're talking about too like i've, I've seen american black bears who have like a little splotch but usually it's just this really uh well-defined big crescent moon that they'll have across yeah. their chest kind of looks like uh, a but yeah the, the main some of them. <laughs> exactly exactly but the main the main is another good good uh point of disparity between the two as well and people obviously could look up pictures online and find a lot of photos to get a sense of what we're talking about. What is the cliff notes on what you learned about cortisol levels in proximity to human settlements and agriculture? So one of the takeaways, you know, it's, it's, it's worth noting, you know, I, I talked a little bit about the fact that these different nature reserves, you know, some of them are open to um, ecotourism and some of them are, you know, largely off limits or at least big chunks of them are off limits because it's prime panda bear habitat. Um, but then there are others where, you know, people are actually living within the boundaries of the nature reserve in some cases. And you have like villages that are right up against the edge of the nature reserve. And all of this potential for the conflict that we've been talking about between the the humans and the and the species. And those places where you have like row crop agriculture, um, you know, primarily a lot of corn being grown. Um, also uh, apiaries, you know, bees, bees are mm -hmm. a big deal. Honey's a big, a big thing in some of those places. I was working in Sichuan, Yunnan and Shanxi provinces and particularly in like Northwest Sichuan, there's famous honey there. So anyway, where you have these places with candy on the landscape, whether it's corn or honey, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you have bears that are raiding those resources. One of the, one of the takeaways from the work that we did there was realizing that of all the different variables we were looking at that years when natural food abundance was low and and bears were in proximity to those human food resources there was a, a pattern of 
uh, elevated cortisol levels in those bears. And, you know, so when you think about that from a, from a management standpoint, um, you're not going to, you're not going to like move villages away from the nature reserves and you're not going to eliminate bears from the nature reserves, but are there, are there treatments that we could be implementing to try to promote natural food abundance? Are there things that we could try to do to make the landscape more robust in terms of filling in food gaps in years where maybe there's an oak mast crash or failure? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, those, those are the kinds of questions that start popping up, but you know, it's also worth just bearing in mind, like the kinds of uh, human bear conflicts that we're talking about there have been a part of the story for, you know, for thousands of years in these places. Um, But yeah, it was cool to be able to see that, you know, some of these variables that we were interested in studying did in fact correlate to differences in, in the fecal cortisol levels in that species. That's so interesting. You know, as somebody who just loves bears, the idea of meeting some of these, you know, bears from the other hemisphere is really interesting to me. And um, I'm also accustomed in Maine here to be able to buy a bear tag over the counter uh, year after year. And we're looking at potentially adding a second tag now in Maine um, that would be over the counter as well because our population is so high and so sort of take that for granted a little bit. I'm curious if you can tell me as a hunter being in China and getting to observe how conservation works there, you know, how, what's, what's really different and is there anything similar? And, you know, how did that lead, lead you to appreciate, you know, the benefits of our system and or recognize detriments in our system? So I think on the whole, it's, it's quite different. Um, and you know your note of gratitude, like you sh- you should be reminding yourself of the fact that <laughs> there's a lot to be appreciated around the opportunities that we have here. And actually, I've had a chance to host some of my Chinese friends in the United States to hunt here. I had a oh, one of my wow. cool. great Chinese friends um, drew a non-resident tag out in New Mexico and um, shot a mule deer while he oh, was cool. with me, and it was one of the hunting experiences I've filed away that will be with me for I'm sure the rest of my life. But to get back to your question, like there are sort of two categories of hunting activity in China that I've, I've come to know about. Um, and one is the, the kind of standard model people would get in their heads when you think about like really high value tags, international trophy hunting. Um, you know, perfect example would be like the Marco Polo Argali sheep where, you know, the tags are going to be on the order of six figures, maybe $100,000, $200,000. People with ample means, shall we say, are traveling from outside of China um, to uh, work through local outfitters and guides and um, go and pursue these like very iconic uh, big game animals. So there's that bucket that happens. And it's really similar. You know, you can think of it as like, sort of the African model yeah. um, where it's like a pay to play kind of where does rich that money man's go? game. Um, it depends, but you know, when, when those kinds of programs are functioning well, and one of the examples I'm familiar with in China was in the, the Northwestern part of China near the border with Mongolia um, in Xinjiang province, they have uh, one of these Marco Polo sheep operations. And the idea there is trying to, uh, provide some resources that can benefit the local communities where, um, you know, rather than having people who are trying to raise livestock on the landscape and the livestock are in competition with the wild sheep, is there a way to bring in some outside funding that can help, uh, support those people's livelihoods and encourage them to sort of maintain space on the landscape that they're helping manage, uh, for forage for wild sheep to try to prevent poaching of those wild sheep um, to figure that into the equation when they are uh, when they're booking their uh, like their rates of, of uh, yaks and sheep, like how many are they going to be putting out on the landscape, all that decision-making. Um, so, you know, in a perfect world, the money would go to at least in part supporting the local communities. And that's, you know, that's the case to varying degrees, depending on, the specifics, right? <laughs> yeah, because I imagine the Communist Party gets a cut of, of that, I would assume, anyway. Um, For sure. There's there's some administrative fee that's going to come off yeah. the top. The, the real question is, and not just not just 
in China, but in any of those situations, like are the, are the right systems in place, the checks and balances to make sure that, yeah. um, you know, that the money is ending up where it can do the most good. Um, and I think especially, you know, in some of these remote, remote places, you know, those kinds of dynamics are prone to, um, you know, prone to malfeasance. Um, but there are plenty of <laughs> mismanagement. Yeah. But there's, there are plenty of success stories that we could point to yeah. as well. And, you know, I think we have, we oftentimes look at, look at those with kind of our nose turned up like, well, that's not, that's not the North American model. The reality is, man, there's so many places and examples where if we don't have a mechanism to add that value to the wildlife, like in terms of dollars and cents, it's going to go away and it already is going away in a lot of places. Africa is such so, a good example of this kind of totally sort of at the crossroads with a lot of those kind of decisions. A hundred percent. And it's not something I'm like, if I have a hundred thousand dollars, I'm not going to be the guy who's paying to go shoot an Argali sheep in Mongolia. Um, but neither is that but, guy. That guy has $15 million or a right, hundred yeah. million dollars, right? <laughs> but you get where I'm going. It's like, I, I, I'm not the guy who wants to participate in that, but I'm right, also right. ready to acknowledge and be grateful for the fact that we have sort of different tools in our toolbox to try to promote right. the persistence of wildlife on the landscape. I'm sure you saw that film, uh, Trophy, that's uh, on, on Netflix. Did you see that documentary? I have not seen the documentary oh, Trophy, yeah. but I'll write myself a note oh, to check man. it out. You should check it out. So what it, what it's showing, and it you know you see a lot of trophy hunters that I got to say, as a hunter, you, it's cringy. People who are I wouldn't say are really hunters, but people who have the money and find themselves interested in this kind of world, and but then you see also where that money's going. And in particular, it's about um, black rhinos and. Um, that part of what's keeping black rhinos on the landscape is this trophy money. And you're really presented with the, the paradox and a lot of the nuance. Like how do you, you know, you see things that you're like, Oh, that's kind of really turns me off yet. If it wasn't happening, what would be the results? And there's no easy solution there. But I think I walk away going, Hey man, let this thing happen because some of these iconic species are far too important to let my scruples you know, get in the way of or whatever, but yeah, it's, it's like, like, show yeah. me a better alternative. Yeah. Like I'm all yeah. ears, man. Like let's, let's yeah. put all the options on the table and figure this out. I, I would prefer that we don't lose black rhinos. Yeah. We've lost <laughs> can enough, that, we've can lost that be enough a shared elephants goal? in the last 10,000 years, you know, it's like, like to keep some, some species on the landscape, but you said that there was two kinds of hunting going on over there. So one is this sort of, um, sport hunting that, that feeds back to conservation there. Yeah. And then the other one would be probably, a little more familiar uh, to us. And that's like the sort of local subsistence hunting people, maybe shooting a wild boar for the pot kind of hunting and okay. uh, the vast majority of it being totally illegal, but having it be like fairly rampant. And, you know, in the nature reserve system where I was working, um, you know, now I don't want to go too far down this, this rabbit trail here, but like the woodcraft of some of the guys that I was out in the field with was incredible. And their ability to say, like, we'd be walking down a trail and be like, oh, here's a snare, you know? And they would just walk off and like, I'm looking at the ground saying, what are you talking about? And they poke their stick in the ground and, you know, a, a snare wow. springs up around their stick kind of thing. <laughs> wow. yeah. So these guys, you know, they were helping me with my nature with my nature reserve research, but they're also out there doing anti-poaching patrols and just spending all this time on the ground. And many of them also had been like former poachers. You know, one of the guys that I spent time working with um, had been convicted of, of poaching within one of the nature reserves. He served his time and then ended up, you know, getting a job with the reserve oh, wow. down the line, which was a great move by them because the guy knew the landscape big time. But anyway, whether it's by snaring or in some cases, uh, you know, through the use of, of illicit firearms or, you know, in some cases, police officers using their firearms for recreational right. purposes. I heard of that happening. There's this, you know, this little bit of, I shouldn't say a little bit because I don't know the scale of it. There is some amount of uh, subsistence oriented uh, illegal hunting in these places where people's primary motivation is something Food. for the pot. Is and it, then you bush, could look is at it a bush meat industry though? Like people are selling it for, for meat or is there's it certain, there's certainly some of that. 
Yeah, no, there's, yeah. there's, it's a combination of personal use and then black market. Um, right, and it's right, all yeah. kinds of species that people wouldn't even necessarily would be thinking of. I mean, <laughs> yeah. in the COVID era, everybody's talking about pangolins and bats, right? But there's like, there are these giant salamanders that are incredibly oh, yeah. valuable that people are Hellbenders, looking at. Uh, I, I, it would be similar to a hellbender. I'm not going to tell you it's exactly the same species because right. I don't think that's the case, but they're these giant aquatic yeah. Asian seen, salamanders video, that are, yeah. and they're worth like tens of thousands of dollars wow. on the black market because they're yeah. such a delicacy. So there's oh, people, you know, poaching for sale. There's people poaching for personal use. There's the traditional Chinese medicine trade where like with black bears, you know, they might, kill the bear and sell like the two most valuable parts of the bear would be the gallbladder and the paws, which in America would be like two parts that probably end up not even getting used yeah. most of the time. Right. But anyway, selling that stuff can, you know, you, you could be a farmer and maybe make like a year's worth of income from one poached Asiatic black bear oh, is wow. kind of the, the scale of value around some of that. Hence the importance of, of finding ways to put a alternative value on the animal being alive right or right and available yep. in some other way yeah yep and that's where you know the ecotourism sort of angle on the conversation comes into play trying to figure out how to how to create uh a financial picture around the value of nature where those communities those villagers are saying okay like i can see how having this place be ecologically intact is benefiting all of us and right you know there's the trophy hunting angle on that there's like the international tourism angle on that of people coming from all over the place to see your beautiful mountains and wildlife but you know unfortunately the reality is like if people don't perceive some sort of direct benefit to these resources they're going to be much more dismissive of their value right, right? i mean it's we're, we're wired to think in terms of how's this helping me out um right but the average person in China couldn't go and get a hunting license and there isn't a suite of animals like we would have here that we think of as typical game, you know, anything from waterfowl to, you know, our, our white-tailed deer to our moose to our bear. You know, we're just, in, you know, it's we've grown up with it here, this model, but they don't have anything that would sort of um, approximate that there? No, nowhere near what we would have here. Um, uh, yeah. You know, the, the closest thing that comes to mind is people – people doing some fishing here and there. Um, but nothing like, you know, you being able to buy a couple over the counter bear tags every year. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. It's unbelievable to me what we can do here. And, and given, given that the population is so large and there's so much development that we can enjoy this kind of an opportunity is just in this modern era is sometimes hard to even conceive for me, but it's incredible. Um, I don't want to see it change or go away. And it kind of brings me to that part of the conversation we started off with, which is how do we maintain this? And I think one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, um, I heard you on a podcast where you were presenting to the audience a sort of this or that option. Um, and you were talking about whether hunters should be um, looking out for themselves and each other and, or whether we should be reaching out to other folks. And I guess the greater context for me is currently in conservation, you know, it's largely people buying hunting and fishing licenses and equipment that's funding our conservation system, as you know. And, uh, there's been a lot of debate about whether we should broaden that, um, to include other stakeholders and other users. Um, you know, and you'll hear conversations like, should folks who are backpacking or birding or should they be paying into this system? And then you get the pushback from hunters saying, well, if they do, we start to have our voice diluted by, by potentially by people who are against hunting. Uh, and so I'm so divided on this issue and I wanted to get your perspective. And if, uh, for the listener, if I left anything out that you want to add for context before you start to answer, please do. And I'm just curious where you land on this because I have found very often that the folks we talk about bringing into the conversation are people that if they could push a button and make hunting disappear, they would probably do it a lot of times. Uh, and so it brings us back to this conversation. How do we win over the hearts and minds of folks and should we should they have more of a voice because they certainly are stakeholders um and i feel bad excluding them too i think that was a really good 
sort of summary of the conundrum. Um, so I don't really have anything to add to it, but uh, in terms of my perspective on that question, you know, we could, we could talk about a few things. I mean, the funding piece, first of all, uh, to me is like, it's an important piece of the puzzle because we need, we need money to do good work, but there's sort of a broader philosophical conversation that we can get to in a second, but let's, let's talk about the money piece. So yeah, we've got a long history of hunters and anglers, licensed buyers paying into the coffers and then having all kinds of great conservation success result from that. And that's something that we should really continue to be proud of and, and celebrate. And if we look at the next hundred years, I don't think that's a sustainable yeah. funding model. Yeah. We have Agreed. decreasing Agreed. participation in these activities. We have increasingly complex and expensive conservation challenges that we're trying to work our way through. Um, we have, uh, in some, in some cases, uh, real reticence around the idea of continuing to ratchet up license fees. You know, it's already, it already has in a lot of instances, sort of the vibe of being an increasingly rich person's game. You know, I've, I've had a chance to hunt like as a non-resident hunt moose in Idaho and that's just from a license standpoint, that was like somewhere in the two to three thousand dollar range once you figure out all the yeah. all the tags and, and licenses. And I'm happy to spend that money and happy to have it going to a good cause. But you know, if we want if we want to remove barriers from participation um, and have it be truly accessible to all people, we can't we can't continue to ratchet up license fees and have that be the sole source of financial support for our state, state game and fish agencies. And so I think it is an absolute necessity that we come up with some solutions for conservation funding in the there's United States. There's so much more money out there. There's so much money and people, there's so many ways people would be willing, but I would just like, I would want like an amendment to the constitution that hunting can never go away. And then it's like, okay, now let's get those folks paying in. Cause you know, that's my fear is, the idea that hunters are solely paying for this, while I'm proud of that, it seems so limiting because the conversation around ecology and the conversation around environment and the conversation around diversity of species is so uh, broad. Now. Like everybody's a part of that conversation now and they weren't in the past, but now everyone's aware of it. And so I think people are much more willing to put in some money, if especially if it's a, if it's something like a Pittman-Robinson tax on backpacking equipment or on, you know, a, a dozen other things, but it's just like, Oh, I get the heebie jeebies thinking about it. So we, we talk, you know, you talk about these different excise taxes and, you know, the idea of a backpack tax or, you know, somebody buying their hiking boots, paying an additional tax. And, you know, I think like one of the sort of fundamental principles I come back to is, you know, who ultimately should be part of these conversations around the management of public trust resources. And I think it's not just the people who are hunting or fishing or the people who are going backpacking or buying a pair of boots or binoculars. I think like the whole premise of the North American model is that these are resources that belong collectively yeah. to all the citizens of a state. And so yeah. that's where, you know, some of the states that have already taken steps towards broadening their funding models. And I would point to a couple of specific examples. Folks should check out like what Missouri and Minnesota have done. And there are other examples we could get into as well, but those are two states where you have a statewide sales tax that benefits the state department of natural resources, Minnesota DNR and the Missouri department of conservation. And those are two of the best run state game and fish agencies in the nation in no small part because of the fact that they've got great staffing, they've got robust budgets. And I would, I would, you know, ask the rhetorical question of, have you been hearing about how things are blowing up in Missouri and Minnesota now that all these people are part of the natural resource decision-making process? Yeah. No, I have not. It's yet. like, no, you haven't. And, and those are places where the States are, are gaining greater access for all outdoor enthusiasts to be able to recreate in more places on more acres. They're doing more science. They're doing better land management and the places where things are blowing up, you know, the places where they're talking about 
statewide bans on various activities and, you know, a reduction in terms of opportunities to participate in these activities. Those changes are happening regardless of how the state agency is being funded. Well, Those things are happening <laughs> because mm-hmm. people are, people are pursuing ballot initiatives. People are winning uh, the, the sort of public discourse mm-hmm. around uh, values associated with fish and wildlife. And if people think that excluding other user groups from the funding model for the state game and fish agency is somehow going to prevent these broader social changes from radically altering the landscape that shapes natural resource decision-making. They're totally fooling themselves. And this gets me back to the point where I started with, it's like, we should be putting our best foot forward, making it clear to everybody involved that we share these common values around fish and wildlife habitat, people's connection to the natural world, we care about the places and the species that we hunt. We're more than, you know, like a bunch of bloodthirsty, crazy, you know, disrespectful uh, Elmer Fudds running around out there. Mm-hmm. We are passionate and um, deeply invested in these systems and in these species. And the other thing that that does, I think, you know, spent a lot of time talking about recruitment like trying to get more people involved in these activities. And it's the exact same dynamics that hold us back in terms of being able to recruit new people. You know, there's, there's a lot of folks out there who I think if they were approached in the right way about wild food and about connection to nature and about reverence and respect for the natural world, they might be able to see themselves as participants, but Mm -hmm. we hold ourselves back when we self-represent in ways that reinforce some of those negative stereotypes. Yep. So it's all interconnected, you know, around what kind of an image we bring forward. And that whole argument that if we share this decision space with other people, they're going to take it all away. It's like, we already shared that decision space. And the, the facet of this that's represented by how our state agencies are funded is a, is a relatively small piece of that bigger picture. And it's a piece where we need money to do good work to benefit fish and wildlife. And if you're opposed to other people being part of that conversation, I see you as being uh, a limiting aspect in the conversation as opposed to somebody who's, you know, oriented towards solutions and getting good things done. Such awesome points, man. And uh, you kind of just won me over with that, with your point about um, regardless of whether or not people are seen as stakeholders that they're still uh, it's still leading to ballot initiatives. They're still doing, you know, the so-called antis continue to do their work regardless of, of any of this anyway, that that's not really um, a limiting factor. So very good point. Um, Tell me what you picture. If you could kind of, you know, if you had the magic wand, like how, what would you like to see change? What would you like to see actually happen? And what kind of changes are realistic, like out into the future? Because, the landscape, uh, our social landscape is changing so fast. And obviously the boomer generation passing on and the millennial generation and the, you know, X generation coming up in is going to change the landscape so dramatically. The world today is going to be almost unrecognizable in a couple of decades, right? In some ways. How do you see it changing positively? What would you like to see happen if you could make it happen? I think in terms of this, you know, this whole space around conservation and what kind of relationship we're going to have to these systems, you know, I think like one little, one little piece of evidence that would give me uh, a lot of optimism is if we have more and more people sort of within our hunting and angling community and beyond identifying as conservationists first. Like I am committed to being in community with people around these shared values and trying to figure out what we can get done and not having it be so much driven by the kinds of activities that lead us to that place of appreciation. Um, There's, there's a very splintered, fractured, um, somewhat ineffective collection of voices around these topics. And if we could gel as a community of people who care 
about nature and our place in it, that would be very powerful. And that's happening. I mean, that's, that's, that those changes, those shifts are underway. People are starting to recognize, uh, you know, I mean, in the political space, there's, there are a lot of examples where the polling data are showing, you know, like in Western states right now, uh, the value around wildlife connectivity at landscape scales is something the vast majority of people place very high emphasis on and very high value around. What do you so mean how do by we that? So there, you know, there's, there's constantly polling efforts underway, looking at, looking at within different geographic regions of the country, what are the issues people care about jobs, education, climate change, um, a whole host of, you know, political issues of the day. And I just saw recently um, some polling data that were going into uh, the values around landscape scale habitat connectivity, like mm. the ability of species to move across landscapes and okay, sort of gotcha. checking our our development of places where we know we've got migratory herds of elk and pronghorn and mule deer um and those are things that like way more people care about than the percentage of people who are participating in hunting you right. know we might have sub 10 percent hunters in a state and 80 percent of people saying this is something that they care about. So, you know, why would we as hunters not want to take full advantage of the community building around those common values for fish and wildlife? Mm -hmm. um, and then on the flip side of that coin, like, I believe, you know, as, as people who celebrate our own immersion in these natural systems, anything that we can be doing to try to afford even a modicum of that experience to other people is something we should be passionate about and thinking about. So for example, right now under the land and water conservation fund, we have the opportunity to, you know, as a nation put resources towards projects that benefit land acquisitions out in the middle of nowhere where we can go elk hunting and deer hunting, but we also have opportunities to provide green space in communities that are starving for any kind of reprieve from the urban jungle. Yeah. And my hope would be like anybody who's excited about going out elk hunting or deer hunting and loves nature from that standpoint should feel like they have a reason to be excited about people in downtown Chicago or Detroit or LA having some green space at their disposal. Because we know that opportunity for us as human beings to interface with the natural world is super important to our mental and physical well-being. And there's a lot of people that have zero access to that right now. Yeah, and if so they don't have access to it, then it's very easy for them to go through life without an appreciation for those things. It's like if, if they don't have access to nature, then their decision making is going to be based on that. Exactly. So, you know, we should feel like that's our fight too. You know, we should feel like we've got skin in that game. And rather than having it be, you know, everybody worrying about what the changes to the deer regulations are going to be for next year, these bigger questions about as a, as an American society, what kind of relationship do we want to have to nature and who do we want to provide those opportunities to? To me, those are way more important questions, you know, even than like, do you get one over the counter bear tag next year? Or do you get two? You know, I right, wish, yeah, yeah. I wish we could put as much passion and thought into those bigger questions that affect us at a societal level as we do trying to figure out like which unit we're going to apply for this year for a deer tag. Yeah. I saw a quote from you in your Instagram talking about the sort of the taming of people and just the, the negative outcome of all of that. I always talk about human domestication and to me, as much as I love to hunt or fish or forage, the the bigger picture question is about, for me, is about that, is like, how do we help people reconnect with wildness, whether it's externally or whether it's internally, because the future of the world's more dependent on that than whether I get a bear tag or two bear tag. That is well stated. And, you know, again, like just back to this idea of what proportion of people are going to be participating as as hunters, as bear hunters or deer hunters or otherwise, it's like, I don't want to be 
in a world where it's a minority of people who have any kind of self-identity with the natural world. Because to me, that is that puts us on a trajectory where all the things that we hold dear are literally hanging in the balance. And, you know, I, I am probably more, more passionate about those dynamics than I am, you know, my own participation as a, as a hunter. I think I spend more time certainly now thinking about those questions around our broader connection to these resources and systems than I do, um, you know, thinking about like what my upcoming hunting season is going to be like. <laughs> yeah. I mean, as, I as much as I love thinking much. about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One is like a, one is a planet wide existential question versus, uh, you know, just my personal interest. I mean, I guess I would get, I would give it up if I knew that I could really affect the outcome in a positive way, you know, for the rest of the world. But that said, I guess, um, another question I have for you though, at that sort of more selfish level, I guess, is when you look into the future crystal ball, do you imagine, do you imagine that the hunting opportunity, the angling opportunity then that we have today, do you imagine that 10 years out, 20 years out, 50 years out, a hundred years out, or do you have concerns that we might one day be telling the youngsters about what we used to be able to do? This is the reason that I'm so excited about those those bigger, broader questions because I really do believe we are we're sort of at a fork in the road, and what we decide to do collectively in the near term will be the thing that drives an answer to the question you just posed. Like we are at a point right now where we have so much to be grateful for and also so much at stake. And that underscores the need for sort of a broad collective societal commitment to the importance of nature. And if we play those cards right, you know, I believe there is an alternative here that involves more opportunity. Yeah. Uh, more fish and wildlife than we have currently. I mean, we've seen it brought back from the brink already during the last century. And I think it could, it could continue in a positive trajectory if we were able to put our shoulder into the wheel. You know, there are these ambitious goals around like 30 by 30, trying to protect 30% of the land and ocean for fish and wildlife conservation. It's like, if you're a hunter and you're not excited about 30 by 30, like right. what, 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 what more do you need to hear? Yeah. Um, and there's yeah. a lot of people pushing for that that are, you know, not hunters. Um, so I am, I tend to be just in general an optimistic person. And I think there's a lot of opportunity here for all of us to be part of seizing these opportunities that we have in this generation. And I believe if we, if we fail in that regard, um, there is an erosive quality to time in terms of our relationship with these systems um, mm -hmm. in a default mode, and it will continue to contract. Um, I believe we do not, you know, if we do not have an opportunity at a personal level to interact with these resources, it's hard for us to care about them. But if you yeah. give people an opportunity, it's very easy to build that connection. Like we're okay. wired to appreciate the natural world. The thing that the thing that worries me most is the fact that there's so many of us who just have zero access to it now. Mm -hmm. And how we rectify that, I think, is a question that everybody who cares about nature, whether they're a hunter or not, should really be thinking about. You're bringing up some stuff that I don't hear many people talk about. I'm curious, you've had your voice sort of elevated to the national level. And I'm curious, what's the future for you? I mean, some of these things you're talking about are so important. And, uh, yeah, I'm just curious what you see yourself doing over the next, you know, five, 10, 15 years. Well, I have a lot of passion around being a, you know, being a conservation professional and a public servant. Um, you know, I have the privilege of working for the forest service right now nationally, and I get a lot of satisfaction from being part of an agency that has a mission, uh, where some of these values around land stewardship and human connections to nature are the thing I get paid to think about every day and work on. 
So I'm in a place that I feel good about right now. Um, and then, you know, that's why I'm grateful for opportunities to have these kinds of conversations that might spark ideas in other people's minds um, in the work that they're doing. You know, I think a lot of this boils down to what we do individually, just in terms mm-hmm. of our own relationships. You know, I guess at the at the most micro scale, what I plan on doing is making sure my kids spend a hell of a lot of time outside. Yeah, man. And have a chance to fall in love with these these places and resources and experiences the way I have. I want to give them that opportunity. And I don't have any illusions about being like, you know, the guy who has all the solutions in mind, but I do um, have a personal commitment to doing what I can to put my best foot forward as a representative of our community of passionate conservation oriented hunters and anglers. And I'm going to keep doing that. You know, even if I'm talking to somebody at the corner store or happen to have, you know, a vegetarian over for dinner and they get curious about the elk burger I'm grilling and decide they want to have a sample of it. Like (laughs) I'm going to take advantage of every one of those opportunities. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to keep challenging people who uh, don't put their best foot forward and I'll do that in a respectful way. But, you know, that's one thing I've become like increasingly sensitized to over time is, you know, we need to, we need to, look ourselves in the mirror as a community and ask, are we doing what we can? If we really care about nature, if we really care about our relationship to nature, are we doing the best we can on behalf of everybody? Or are we doing the best we can uh, in terms of just looking out for ourselves? Um, So asking those questions when I have opportunities is another thing I'll do. Yeah, man. You're kind of ahead of your time. I I really appreciate the things you're saying, because I think this upcoming generation is so community oriented that asking themselves that kind of thing is going to be more natural than it has been for, you know, my generation and the generation before mine. I think like uh, there's just a little bit more of that we than there is me going on with the thinking of some of the young people today. But uh, if I was going to just give you the floor for the last little bit here, uh, any kind of last things you want to say to the people listening or... uh, Anything that you want to share? I just grab onto that thread you were talking about in terms of the next generation. Um, as I was listening to you speak there, I, I had a chance yesterday morning to spend time with a class of high school seniors. Um, got invited to a Zoom meeting uh, for sort of an environmental ed oriented session with this group of seniors. And, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't really thought in advance about what that what that shared digital space would be like, but we got onto the zoom meeting and, you know, there's a, there's a class of probably 20 kids and everybody's at home on their, on their laptop. And I was, I was starting off, you know, my presentation to these young adults thinking about what it would be like to have, you know, 2021 be your senior year. And how, how different that is from what I experienced. I graduated from high school in 2000 and, you know, just the relationships to my classmates and how, um, you know, because of this pandemic that we're in right now, there's so many kids, so many young adults missing out on so much of that connectedness that you just talked about. And I think this, you know, the things that we're experiencing right now where we're, so many of us are missing our friends, missing our families, um, you know, I think a lot of people are, are struggling on a personal level to just kind of keep going with this grind that everybody's in. Um, as we come out of this in the foreseeable future, um, the way that we re-engage and sort of seek connections to each other is going to be something that um, all of us are going to be trying to navigate and maybe struggling with a little bit. It's been a year now that we've been sort of cut off from each other. Um, But I also think it's one of the things I'm taking away from it is uh, it is, it is highlighting for me how important those connections are to the people I care about and the people I'm missing. And I do have, you know, a stronger sense of appreciation for those connections and if indeed subsequent generations put more stock in those dynamics, you know, I personally think that's a good thing. There's, there's a piece of American identity that's rooted in this idea of like the rugged individual. Um, 
and I there are aspects of that that I love and identify with. But the challenges that we are facing now as a mm-hmm. global community do not mesh well with a bunch of people acting as rugged individuals. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, we need to start wrestling with some of these concepts in a way that hinges more on that connectedness and relationship building. So maybe that, that theme, that idea, as we come out of the pandemic and seek those reconnections could be something folks are rolling around in their minds as, as I certainly will be doing. Thanks for listening to the wild fed podcast. You can help us grow the show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out the Wild Fed video show and store. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.